Welcome to Oddball. Oddball is presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings Pick 6 and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Oh, yeah. I mean, J.J. Redick is a Lakers new head coach. Who could have seen that coming? No one had any idea. Oh, my God. What about the most sought-after coach in all the land? Is he available? Danny no? Hurley? Okay, maybe not. All right, okay. Uh, JJ is LeBron's, is younger than LeBron. He came into the league yeah, three years after him. Everybody's the same age, roughly the same age. Oh yeah, he's 39? Yeah, LeBron's age. 39. It's just, Wait, you know is LeBron is? 40 LeBron yet? turns 40 in December. December 30th. He is literally the, la- the latest calendar birthday I think we have in the NBA. I don't think we have a December 31st player. So that's what it is. Everyone, it's like, Technically, this is his age 40 season that's about to start right, right now. But, like, he doesn't turn 40 until really late. I feel like LeBron's been 39 for, like, five years now. Hashtag uh, washed king or Wanna whatever. Want to feel old? <laughs> uh, anyway, so the what is your initial reaction uh, to J.J. actually getting this job? I mean, like, this is a fait accompli, as they say, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we knew this. Shout mm-hmm. out to Sham Charania. Mm-hmm. We knew this for a while, that he was the target. He was the guy. Some people... Try to do a little trickery and like, oh, no, actually, because I didn't get the story. Oh, it's this guy over here. But nobody fell for the banana in the tailpipe. And so now we get to actually talk about this for real as opposed to chasing red herrings. Right. And the reality is, Charlie, you and I have talked about this. This is not a good job. Right. I know it's the Lakers and Lakers legacy and all the banners and Pat Riley and Phil Jackson and LeBron James and Anthony Davis, all NBA players. It's not a good job for two reasons. One, the roster sucks outside of those two guys. Mm-hmm. And two, the expectations are not commiserate with where the roster is. Right. Okay. Here's my thing. I mean, Mm -hmm. for a run-of-the-mill assistant coach who has worked his way up through the ranks of coaching, this is a chance at a head coaching job. Terrible. Like Darvin Ham, basically? Like Darvin (laughs) Ham. Terrible job for Darvin Ham. If I were were like a James Borrega or Uh someone who has a bright future in head coaching, I would be like, I am not taking this job because I'm probably not going to win a championship, Mm -hmm. which is the unrealistic expectation. I'm going to get pushed off, and I probably won't get another head coaching opportunity for a while. You're J.J. Redick. You're like, okay, uh, this is sort of a win-win for me because he comes in with these outsized expectations Mm -hmm. where everybody knows they're outsized. If he doesn't win a championship, it's like, well, it was his first year. Like he's also a handsome white guy who is going to get another shot at coaching. And I think of all the people who could do this, he's going to be good at it. Like, I I don't think he's going to get walked all over the way other new coaches might in a situation with LeBron. Cause LeBron's like, Cool. Right. I so, want you to be my coach. So there is. So I want to be clear about that because a lot of people are going to write and talk about how LeBron picked the coach. LeBron didn't pick the coach. The Lakers picked the coach that they thought had the best relationship with LeBron, mm-hmm. which is actually kind of smart when you think about it. It's like right. if we know this guy is super particular, super picky, right? Why are we going to force a selection on him? Who may be good, but also may rub him the wrong way. This way, it's kind of like, hey, we already got past the first hurdle, which is. Does LeBron trust this guy? Does is LeBron comfortable around this guy? And I think J.J. Redick checks that box. He also is confident enough to be like, yeah, I can do this. Oh, yeah. No, he's he's, Which, he's a psycho. Yeah. He's a, he's he's a, a sicko. sicko. He's, he's a basketball a sicko. sicko. He's a basketball sicko for um, sure. He's probably also going to go ballistic on the refs. Uh, very excited for that. He's going to be... He, they, the Lakers are hoping he's their next Pat Riley. So this is the thing. So he is... He is... Like, people say he doesn't coach. Well, he has coached. He's coached yeah. AAU. Yeah. And the intel that I've received from the AU world is he is an absolute kind of madman going off on refs, going off on little rich kids that play for him and stuff. So I I, I wonder how much of that he needs to rein in versus how much of that does he need to bring to the job? Because as we talked about with Luka Doncic during the finals, I think there's a way to go off on refs. I think there's a a formula there. But again, JJ's played in the league 8 billion years. He knows all of these things. And I think all it comes down to is do you have the credibility yeah. within your locker room? And when you walk in with LeBron co-signing, it kind of gives you a significant boost of credibility until LeBron changes his mind, but there's no reason to believe that'll happen anytime right. soon. Yeah, I think JJ's going to do as good a job as anybody could, maybe better. Um, and I think we're also going to have a lot more time to talk about this in the offseason. Uh, we do have to talk about how Oklahoma City traded away Josh Giddy mm-hmm. to the Bulls for Alex Caruso. No picks involved. Yep. Swap one for one. Mm-hmm. 
uh, that surprised me a little bit mm-hmm. that I was like, Alex Caruso is such an unbelievable defender that at this point, I, the only guy who had better numbers than he did uh, was Lou Dort, who's already on the right, Thunder. Right. So, why, so for Josh Giddy, who's still young and not as good as he's going to be, I right. guess I see it. But what's going on here? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things. A lot of people are like, oh, my God, I can't believe what Let, let's start with the obvious. Mm-hmm. Alex Caruso is at this point a better basketball player than Josh Giddy. Josh Giddy is scratching the surface of how good of a basketball player he can be. All right. Yep. So that's number one. This is a trade for give me someone who can help me win now versus waiting. And when you have a team as young as Oklahoma City, like you, you got to mix it up at some point. You can't wait for everybody to cross that finish line. Number two, Josh Giddy had a very embarrassing public relations snafu happen to him, regardless of whether he was found innocent or the, the charges were dismissed. That stain is still there. And Oklahoma City is a very conservative market, and it's mm-hmm. a conservative team. They don't want to have to deal with that stuff. So that's out the way. Number three, and I think this is the one that's a lot of people are missing, yep. is this is a Sam Presti formula. He never lets guys get to free agency. He did it one time, and it was Kevin Durant, and we all know how that worked out. Right. But other than that, before Durant and since Durant, if there's a guy coming up on free agency, you're either going to sign an extension or you're out of here. Yeah. And this is Presti basically taking the initiative of saying, look, I don't want to, A, get into how much this guy is worth at this point. Mm-hmm. B, knowing I have a bunch of other deals coming up that I'm going to have to do. The cost certainty of knowing what Caruso's making makes it so that like yeah. I'd rather have that right now. Yeah. And then from the Chicago side, I get it. Giddy had like a really rough season and and make no mistake, that shit affected him. Mm-hmm. It, like people say, oh, they tune it out in the basketball court is my my solace. And no, no, no. He was he was affected by this. But he's a good player. Not only like for the future, but like for right now, he's a pretty good player. As luck would have it, he's duplication of what Oklahoma City already has. So they didn't need him as much. But Chicago, a team that Waste no time reminding us every time that, hey, when you look at the team, remember, we thought Lonzo Ball was going to be healthy. And Lonzo Ball was the key to this whole thing working. Totally. And, and he's a, a playmaker and a creator or whatever. Giddy can fill in that role. Yeah. And especially as, like, in Oklahoma City, he had to play off ball because Shea has the ball. Yeah. You come to Chicago, now he gets to be the guy he, he was always meant to be. All right. Well, we have Bet the Shows based on this. Bet the Shows presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Oh, yeah. So the first one is the Lakers championships odds. Those are plus 3,000. They were, before JJ was hired, plus 2,000. So the odds got better once he got hired, but that means people think that he will maybe not yeah. do well, which is, I would have well, thought that the, it would have gone the other way. Yeah, because but the plus 2,000 when they thought they were getting the most sought-after basketball coach in all the land. My bad, my bad. So that's, that okay. doesn't count. Is there enough value there to make this worth betting? The, the other teams at plus 3,000 are the Warriors, Suns, and Clippers, so basically all of the old guys yeah. who were are I, unbelievable basketball players. I would certainly take Suns or Clippers at plus 3,000 above the Lakers. I don't think any of them are good bets, but I think those are better bets. Warriors is tough, especially if we don't know what's going to happen with Clay Thompson. Right. All right. Second one, the Thunder championships odds are plus 850. Mm. The only teams that have lower odds are the Nuggets and the Celtics. Boston is at plus 290. Denver is at plus 800. The Timberwolves are at plus 900. Yeah. Which, so people think that the 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 betting lines say that the Thunder have a better chance. I feel like the Caruso, I feel like that was a huge piece. Yeah. For them. I think it's, I don't hate that at all. I do too. And, and remember, they still have to get uh, another big, you know, we've heard talk about them maybe going after Isaiah Hartenstein mm-hmm. in free agency. So I, I think Oklahoma City, that's a that's a nice bet. I, the Nuggets are still the best team in the league because they have the best player. And I think the best starting five, the Celtics are the defending champs. So you got to give them that. But I think outside of those two, it's definitely Oklahoma City. Mm. Celtics could be seen as the best team in the league because they did just win the championship. But, you know. uh, Whatever. uh, After the break, I mean, we're going to have more of our interview with Tom Haberstroh Mm -hmm. about Michael Jordan's uh, home-cooked stats. He's going to reveal more about his findings there. And uh, we are going to have a great conversation with him. I can't wait because, you know, we posted... The original, you know, first yeah. half of the interview yesterday. Yeah. And the number of comments are just, well, we already knew all this. It was like, bullshit, you knew. You, <laughs> you knew that the, a team could have 10 turnovers and we're going to call them all steals? You knew that? Like, sad inflation is one thing. This is something completely different. And I want people to really listen to what Tom is talking about. Because there's a big difference between, was that an assist? Ah, maybe, maybe not. Versus, 
24 second shot clock violation. Give it a steal Give to Michael it a Jordan. Steal. That's explosive stuff, guys. Stick around. Welcome back. Yesterday, we aired the first two parts of our interview with Tom Haberstroh about the stat keeping during Michael Jordan's 1988 Defensive Player of the Year award. Uh, fascinating stuff. And here is the final part of our interview. Tom, you wrote this incredible piece about Michael Jordan's 87-88 Defensive Player of the Year campaign about how the, the stats seem to have been manipulated or, or not manipulated, I should say, oh, inflated, inflated at the time of their recording. Um, I'm curious, did you talk to any of the contemporary media people of the day and what they had to say about it? Yeah, uh, I actually got uh, on the phone with Bob Ryan, legendary uh, Boston Globe writer who was a voter in the 88 season, not just on MVP, but also Defensive Player of the Year award and asked him, you know, I have been watching this film, looked at the stats, and it seems like there is some home cooked stats uh, for Michael Jordan in Chicago that like 30%, up to 30% of his steals were uh, n not apparent, uh, could be phantom steals given to Michael Jordan erroneously. And I asked him his thoughts on that because he had given Larry Bird the MVP that year. Michael won it, of course, 88, both scoring title and defensive player of the year award. He was the MVP running away. Um, Bob Ryan was like, doesn't surprise me at all. And Bob really? was like, you know, doesn't you have to remember him at all. He's like, you have to remember Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. There were accusations back and forth about their their rebounding totals that they were home cook stats and that like wilt would have 42 rebounds and then bill russell would have you know 38 and it would only be in their home arenas when they got those outrageous uh rebound totals and he would talk about magic johnson and his assists at the forum versus when he was on the road and what he was laughing about was the idea that Michael Jordan was so obsessed about becoming the Defensive Player of the Year award winner in 88. Because remember, guys, he was left off the all-defensive first team the year before when he had a record-breaking number of blocks and steals. And so Michael Jordan came out in Sports Illustrated in an, in an article, came out and said, I hate the way that defensive awards are being recognized only on reputation, not about steals, not about blocks, not about the stats. And he had felt that it was all based on reputation rather than statistics. And he went out and had the greatest statistical defensive season ever. His averages and steals and blocks is still combined, has not been duplicated since 1988. And Bob was like, no one cared about Defensive Player of the Year. It was a nothing award. So for Michael to be so angry that Michael Cooper the year before won it without any defensive stats, and he became so angry that he went out and and made it possible like he just got a kick out of the fact that it was michael jordan and he was saying it's the most he's michael jordan story obsessed ever. he's the greatest most uh and i took it personally meme that is michael jordan to his core he is wired to take umbrage on the littlest thing and turn it into this molehill into a mountain and so bob ryan just got a kick out of that so, Tom, two things stand out to me about the story. One, the fact that Bob Ryan said nobody cared about Defensive Player of the Year, and this has now become something that sports media people hang their hat on as the sole reason a lot of the time that MJ is better than LeBron because that's what all of this sort of boils down to. Secondly, the fact that it was it was sort of vibes-based. Like, if stats <laughs> could be home-cooked and if everybody <laughs> thought that, then, like, do we now put like an outsize, you know, importance on stats because we believe them? Like, is that what's going like, it, there? There's so much here. I can't even. <laughs> yeah, I would say if you're using the 88 Defensive Player of the Year award as a reason that LeBron isn't as good as Michael, it's it. I would throw that out. I would throw out the 88 wow. Depoy as a reason or as a chip in the scale of Michael and LeBron, because look, Michael was a great, great defender. 
a good defender most seasons, great one at times. Was he the best in 1988? Well, put it this way. He was 71 more steals at home than at home than on the road that season. If you look at just how many steals he had on the road, he was fourth in the NBA, tied for fourth in the NBA with Very Michael good. Adams of the Denver Nuggets, okay? Who's not known as a good defender, but he had the same number of road steals as Michael Jordan in that record-breaking season. I think if Michael Jordan didn't have the stat keeper in position, this might be a totally different story about Michael Jordan's defensive acumen. Um, and I do think that that year, I, I don't think you can use that as the tiebreaker for the LeBron and Michael Jordan debate. I, I just don't think we can use it because it's not an accurate portrayal. Uh, his blocks and steals that year was not an accurate portrayal of his actual statistics and contributions that season. Tom, one of the other things I thought was very curious in your article uh, or, or uh, interesting is that Alex Rucker, the former uh, VP of Basketball Ops at the Sixers, the former statistician for the Vancouver Grizzlies who kind of revealed to you about all the stat inflation, that he said he learned a lot of it from like a, a retreat or some sort of kind of like thing where there were all these other guys from other arenas uh, and they were watching film and it was, I believe it was a Stockton and Malone and he said there was no causal <laughs> causal uh, relationship between the pass and the made basket but everyone was like oh yeah it's definitely an assist yeah yeah so like this uh this was told to me for pablo torre finds out uh i talked to alex rucker who was like yep there was this detroit like convention uh summit among stat keepers and he was 19 years old which by the way you should probably have to be able to <laughs> you know drink alcohol yeah. uh in order to be allowed to be the official stat keeper for an, an mea team um so in, in 1995 or whatever he's 19 years old he's in this room as he, he tells this story uh with all these no pun intended grizzled sc scorekeepers right and he realizes the implication of saying, yeah, that's an assist because it's John Stockton. The implication was to him was this is an entertainment business, right? Is that like benefit of the doubt, you give it to the star player. Um, and so when I, I heard that from Alex, it immediately made me think of, well, what is the award that could be most influenced or most disproportionately affected by home cook stats. And that's what brought me to the Defensive Player of the Year awards because if blocks and steals are as subjective to those stat keepers as he's alleging, then some of the depoy years from early in the NBA, we have to reevaluate. And mm -hmm. it's not to say that the winners weren't good. It's just, were they the best? Well, if they have huge home road disparities, we kind of have to go back to the drawing board and see whether we were letting the stats dictate who we think is good or not. Because Michael Jordan in 88, if you eliminate that bias, he's just another good defender. He's not far and away the best defender just by using blocks and steals. Did you did you reach out to, to MJ himself, Tom? Or the Bulls or the league or any of these people? Yeah, reached out to uh, Michael Jordan's uh, team, didn't hear back. Um, I reached out to Bob Rosenberg, the stat keeper, during uh, this time, didn't hear back. Um, the NBA declined to comment on the story. And what's interesting to me is like, the, the NBA is in a tough position here because mm -hmm. are, are you going to go back and watch every single game and rechart them and rescore them? I don't know because like it, you can't just do it for Michael Jordan's games. You kind of have to do it for all the games. And that's such a huge undertaking to verify sort of the bedrock statistics. But I'll point out that like of the 26 times that Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell had 40 plus rebounds in a game, all of them were on their respective home floors. Hmm. 26 out of the huh. 26. So the NBA like – in order to like correct this mistake, it's not just about Michael Jordan. It's about the entire league we'd have to verify. What's so fascinating to me about this, guys, is that for a long time in human history until recently, you couldn't really verify stuff. And and what people gravitate towards is the best story. And myths are built on inflated stats of any any kind, any sector, sports, politics, religion, like any of it. 
is based on, you know, the greatest narrative. And it's almost like you you would have to do this for all of human history. Cause you didn't used to be able to like take a picture of something and be like, see, I was yeah. wearing a green shirt. It's like <laughs> it, it, it 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 the way that we remember things has fundamentally changed. Yet the 10 steel game, the NBA posted a video of 10 steals in a single game, Michael Jordan, and then there's only six in the clip. You start to reevaluate everything, right? You're like, wait a minute, was it all a lie? And the answer is, if you are listening to this and you're sitting on some VHS tapes in the attic or in the basement of Michael Jordan's 1988 season, I want to I want to talk to you uh, because I feel like it's not just a story about some uh, potentially fudged statistics. This is also a story of technology and the fact that like now, if Jaron Jackson Jr. is caught, you know, with home cooked stats at home, allegedly, we can verify that in like 30 seconds. We watch all the we clips did, in a matter of, we did this we, last year. We did year, that for Basketball I mean. Illuminati, right? Like this was a big deal. Like someone m noticed these home road disparities and Tom and I got on the Synergy machine and, and literally reviewed every single steal and block that Jaron Jackson had. And we found it's actually kind of accurate. Like this, if anything, Tom, I, I believe our finding was they undersold him. There were a couple of times where like you could have given him a block on that or a steal on that, and he didn't get uh, didn't get that the benefit of the doubt. But you know, for me, it, it it just levels the playing field of. The conversation oftentimes, in our sport, I feel like more than any other sport, comes into, oh, back in our day, it was like this. Da, da. I, I tell the story all the time of Zach Harper and I doing live NBA radio during the summertime. We both had NBA TV on. They're playing a classic game. We're playing, they're playing Knicks versus Pacers. Reggie Miller scores 25 points in the fourth quarter. And this is, again, mythology. Like, oh, my God, Reggie was so clutch and so amazing. He scored 25 points in the fourth quarter. I remember that game. I was a Knicks fan. I grew up watching that game. And then re-watching it now with adult eyes, and not only adult eyes, adult basketball eyes, I realized the Knicks played zero defense on Reggie Miller. The guy had, like, 16 points at one point in the fourth quarter. He's coming down the floor, and the defenders are like, I have to stop Antonio Davis. Like, no, you got to stop the guy who sco scored 16 points. But the mythology has taught us that the Knicks defense was elite, one of the best defenses mm -hmm. ever. And Reggie Miller was so incredibly wily. That that's, that's proof of his wiliness, is that he had to overcome this incredible defense and still score 25. When the reality is, that incredible defense executed some very terrible IQ decisions. Yeah. And Reggie was a beneficiary of like, you're not going to guard me. All right, I'll just make this shot. Right. And you could say that about Michael Jordan's 88 season, right? It's like, who else could average 3.2 steals and 1.6 blocks a game? No one's ever done it since Michael Jordan in 1988. He's that dude, right? But then you look at the road stats and you see that he's averaging uh, 2.1 steals and 1.2 1.2 blocks mm -hmm. that same season on the road. It doesn't have the same effect. 3.2 versus 2.1, 1.6 versus 1.2. So it's the same thing. And I'll go back to this quote from Bob Ryan when I talk to him. Bob Ryan had, a, a, it is kind of eerie that he said this um, in the story. When I asked him about that Depoy season, he writes uh, in the Boston Globe in explaining his votes for MVP, he goes, so, okay, who did have the best year? The truth is, nobody knows for sure. Nobody can claim to have sat down and watched 82 Celtics videotapes and 82 Chicago videotapes. End scene. He Bob wrote Ryan that in 1988? Right in 1988, in the, D the Depoy and MVP conversation, he said, who can know? No one's actually sat down and watched all 82 from the Celtics and all 82 from the Bulls. And that is why he's a Hall of Famer. Unbelievable. Uh, Tom, thank you so much. It, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about this. And maybe it's more fun when like you don't count accurately. Maybe maybe we should go back to myths. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Michael Jordan is actually 5-1 and one in the NBA Finals, not 6-0. <laughs> well, we'll see. Thanks again to Tom Havistow for joining us. Remember, you can catch all of his work on Yahoo Sports and on his Substack, The Finder. And of course, he's a TV analyst for the Portland Trail Blazers. Wow. That was, I can't get enough of that. I, I'm I, thinking about like myth, memory, how he, it's like, it's a huge thing. It's monumental. Yeah. And it should be the biggest talking point for the entire summer for everybody who loves basketball. But for us who love basketball, it's weekend time. Woo! I confirmed it this time. Happy Friday. 